knew there was something I forgot to do. Turn on the PowerPoint projector. But it'll be on here in just a few seconds. We're glad that you came back this evening in, in our continuation of worship to our Heavenly Father today. We've had a good day today. We've had a good number that's been present here. I think it was 66 last Sunday we had and 64 today. And so our numbers are are coming up and I'm very grateful for that. Well, I'm going to... Uh, I'm not going to use the PowerPoint tonight because we're having, I'm having just a little bit of problems. So, uh, if I go too fast for you, just ask me and I'll give you the outline after services. God has a great love for man. We know that. We see it all throughout Scripture, how, how much He loves man. But uh, God also has punished man in the past. Sometimes I'm afraid that man today is more concentrated on the love of God rather than uh, instead of how God will uh, punish man in the end. In Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 10, the text reads this way in the ESV. There is severe discipline for him who forsakes the way. Whoever hates reproof will die. I took that verse and I started looking at all the translations and, and, uh, and it was very interesting to look at the word uh, severe discipline because that's a, a phrase in the Greek. And the New King James has it translated as harsh discipline. And the King James Version reads like this, Correction is grievous unto him that forsaketh the way. And then the verse goes on, He that hateth reproof shall die. In other words, uh, a person that doesn't like to be corrected uh, is going to have a tough time when it comes to judgment. Because they're not willing to accept what God has said. God is going to use His wrath, His, His just anger, on the disobedient of man. Now without a doubt, I don't think, and I'm pretty sure that I'm going to be right here, there is not a soul in this building tonight that likes to be disciplined. Even as a child, I don't think there was anybody that liked to be disciplined. In fact, I hated the idea of getting punished so in that when my report cards came out, I made the F's and the A's and the D's and the B's, trying to fake out my parents, which it did for a little while, but then they got wise to it. Because I knew that I was told that if you come home with us, I'm going to punish you. Well, I didn't want to be disciplined. It wasn't my fault. It was the teacher's fault. Right? Uh -huh. So, even with our children that we had, Nancy and I, and the children that you have, um, discipline that worked for one child uh, may not have worked for the other one. As a matter of fact, I remember, and I don't remember which one complained about it. Was it Stephen or Anna? I mean, <laughs> Stephen or Jessica? But uh, one of them would say, well, you didn't punish Jessica that way or you didn't punish Stephen that way. Well, I knew as a parent that how I punished one of them was not going to work the other way with the other one. No one likes to be disciplined. From a child to an adult. We, we just don't like to do that. But yet, if you think about it, you discipline yourself. Every day, probably. And sometimes you may not even think about it. How many of you have ever been on a diet? You've disciplined yourself. What to eat, what not to eat, when to eat it. So, you've had some self-discipline, right? What if you uh, had, would see that there was something that you knew was wrong? Would you move away from it or stray from it or would you do it? 
chances are you wouldn't do it. So you had self-discipline so that you wouldn't fall victim to uh, maybe what your friends were doing. You are disciplining yourself. And that's exactly what you and I must do as, as a Christian. Go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and look at verse 27. Now this is Paul writing to the church in Corinth. And he says something about self-discipline. He says, I, I discipline my body and bring it into subjection. Isn't that what we do when we self-discipline ourselves in anything and everything? Moderation, guidance, or whatever. Lest when I have preached to others, I myself should be disqualified. Now let's, let's make this application the way Paul meant it in, as far as spiritual. Paul is saying, I have to discipline myself as a Christian. I have got to bring myself into subjection unto what God wants me to do. We don't want to be fooled into thinking that Paul had it all on easy street. We don't want to sit here and think that Paul was not uh, guilty of, uh, or not guilty, should I say, that couldn't make a mistake. Paul could. And so he's saying, I've got to discipline myself when it comes to religion. Alright? Go over to, to uh, 1 Peter. Look at 1 Peter chapter 2. Because Peter uh, deals with the idea of being self-disciplined and how we need to be self-disciplined. Beginning in verse 11 of 1 Peter, Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. Peter is encouraged to self-discipline ourselves against the lust that could have dangerous consequences to our life. Notice verse 12. Having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. This is all about self-disciplining ourselves. Now, again, I want to, many folks today think that God is all about forgiveness and He's not, not into uh, any type of discipline. But God has never been that way. God is loving. God is forgiving. But God has also shown that He is a, 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 serious, uh, a serious person as well. Uh, I want you to consider just in the very first few chapters of the Bible, I want you to consider some examples that we have. How about Adam and Eve? Did he love Adam and Eve? Of course he did. He created them. He put them in a garden. He said, I want you to, to keep it and tend to it. You can have everything to eat except of the tree of good and evil, of the knowledge of good and evil, right? Regardless the reason why Adam and Eve fell to temptation and God punished them. Did he not love them? Well, of course he loved them. He didn't hate them. But he punished them. Put them out of the garden. Made men work by the toll, uh, 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 you know, sweating from the brow, having to do all kinds of manual labor and even childbirth came upon women, a woman because of this. How about Cain and Abel, the first two siblings in creation? How Cain cre uh, killed Abel? Look at verses uh, 12 through 15 of Genesis chapter 4. Was Cain punished for what he did? Yes, he was. He was disciplined. Beginning in verse 12, when you till the ground, it shall no longer yield its strength to you. A fugitive and a vagabond, you shall be on, earth, on the earth. And Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Surely you have driven me out this day from the face of the ground. I shall be hidden from your face. I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond on earth. And it will happen that if anyone who finds me will kill me. And the Lord said unto him, Therefore, whoever kills Cain, vengeance will be taken on him sevenfold. 
And the Lord set a mark on Cain, lest any one finding him should kill him. Cain was punished for his actions. Go over a couple of more chapters. Go over to chapter 6 of Genesis, where we see the whole earth is wicked. Everybody is wicked. Their thoughts on our own uh, wickedness continually. Notice uh, verse 5. The Lord saw that the wickedness of men was great on the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was on evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he made men on earth and he was grieved in his heart. So he said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping things and birds. For I am sorry that I have made them. Man was punished that day. Or punished soon, almost a hundred years. But Noah, we're told, was found was, was found uh, uh, found grace in God's eyes, and Noah was able to build an ark. And in the time that it took, man could have repented. I really believe man could have repented, but they didn't. And then, shortly after the destruction of the whole earth, we see in Genesis chapter nineteen. That man became evil again. If we look in Genesis, Genesis chapter 19, beginning in verse 1, we see that two angels came to Sodom in the evening. And Lot was sitting at the gate of Sodom. And, and we see in this account, um, in, verse, in chapter 19, that, that Sodom was very wicked. I don't know how many years have actually transpired since the, the, the flood, but man, it didn't take long for man to get evil again. And God says, I'm going to destroy Sodom. Lot, you need to get out. Lot, you need to leave. He did. But there was the ruling that don't look back. Whatever you hear, just keep going. Keep moving out. And Lot, his two daughters, and his wife left Sodom and Gomorrah. And no doubt, curiosity must have gotten a hold of Lot's wife because she looked back. And we're, we're told in Scripture to remember Lot's wife. She was punished because she disobeyed God. Sodom and Gomorrah was punished because of the wickedness lifestyles that they were living. In these first few, these first four really incidences in the, in the book of Genesis, we see that God is loving, God is caring, but God is also a vengeance God. And God will punish when He needs to. Now in Hebrews chapter 12, Hebrews chapter 12 talks about the discipline of God. But it also talks about God's grace and God's mercy. So that's where I want us to go to now. I want us to go over to Hebrews chapter 12. And I want us to investigate discipline and how God disciplines. or why, And even why God gets disciplines. First of all, God disciplines because He loves us. God, God disciplined Adam and Eve because He loved them. God disciplined Cain because He loved them. God disciplines man because he loves him. Now, you may be saying, well, you know, how does God discipline us today? There are two ways in which there is discipline in the church. The first way is, is uh, instructive, the Bible. And then there's corrective discipline. In the instructive form of instruction, if you look at Acts chapter 20, verse 28, when Paul was leaving the elders, he said, I'm leaving you to teach the church, to bring the church up, to, to instruct them. As a matter of fact, in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, you and I are commanded to grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So these are instructive discipline. How does God discipline you and I today? instructively through his word in other words he says this is what i want you to do you must do it if you don't do it 
there's a day coming when you're not going to be able to go into heaven, but you'll go into another place. But the other discipline that we have, um, that we deal with today is corrective discipline. And, and most of us know exactly something about corrective discipline because we probably all have had corrective discipline at one time or another as a child. And then we've had to maybe at times uh, instruct our own children with corrective discipline. If you look over in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and let's look at verse 6 beginning. We have a church, the church in Corinth there is glorifying and saying, kind of being prideful of themselves and, and saying, look at us, you know, we are so good and so loving. We accept anybody and everybody for what they do and what they are. But Paul is telling, telling them that your glorifying is not good. As a matter of fact, you have a, 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 a member of your congregation who is in a relationship with his father's wife. And you think that's good? Look at verse 6. Your glory is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens, leavens the whole loaf? Therefore purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, since you are truly in leaven. For indeed, Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, not with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with a leaven of bread uh, of sincerity and truth. I wrote you in my epistle not to keep company with the sexual immoral people, I certainly did not mean with the sexual and moral people of this world or the covenants or the extortioners or the idolaters since you would need to, to go out of the world. But now I have written you to you not to keep company with anyone named a brother, a member, a, a Christian who is sexually immoral or covetous or an idolater or a reveler or a drunker or an extortioner not even to eat with such. For what have I to do with judging those who are on the outside? Do you not judge those who are inside? But those who are outside, God judges. Therefore, put away from yourself the evil person. This is the corrective type of discipline. Paul is saying to withdraw yourself from this man who is in sin. Don't be puffed up about this. You are just as guilty as he is. Go over and look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 6. We command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from any brother who is walking in idleness and not in accord with the tradition you have received from us. In the book of Galatians, we are told to restore a person who is walking in error. So how do you do this? Well, you restore that person with uh, instructive discipline. You teach them. You show them where in the Bible that they are wrong. And if they accept it, you've got a brother again. But if they reject it, it may come to where you have to do some corrective uh, discipline. And you and I are disciplined by God. When we study God's Word, and we find ourselves in error. Now, this, this is where we go into the book of Hebrews. Go back to the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 12. And let's look at verses 5 and 6. You have forgotten the exhortation which speaks of you as to sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, He chastens. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? Wow. You know, I don't know of a, of a person that has ever been disciplined because they, they weren't loved. I was disciplined because I was loved. God disciplines us through the Word because He loves us. But number two, 
when we are disciplined, it will bring about respect and honor to our Father. Now, again, my father disciplined me in many various forms. My mother disciplined me in, in many forms. But I think the worst way that I was ever disciplined is when my dad or my mother would look at me with those eyes and say, I'm so disappointed in you. I would be willing to take a hundred beatings over hearing those words. I am so disappointed in you. That's the last thing I wanted to do, was disappoint my earthly father. But friends, when we sin against God, God loves us. And we should respect Him. But He is so disappointed in us. And the, the thing that I keep thinking about is when Jesus told Peter, you're going to deny me. And Peter says, no Lord, I'm not going to deny you. Oh yes you are, Peter. You're going to deny me three times. And He did it. When that rooster crowed on that third time and Jesus turned and looked at Peter and Peter's eyes met with the Lord's. I could just think of the words that was in Peter's mind. My Lord is so disappointed in me. You know, at first, when my father would discipline me, I, I would think that I'm not deserving of my father's anger his discipline. What did I do that was, was so bad? Well, first of all, I disobeyed my father. And I was deserving of it. But that's the, the mind of a child. And, and that's the mind of, of a person that doesn't quite understand God. God is disciplining us because He loves us. And when we understand God's discipline, we will learn to respect God and His Word so much more. Now, when I think about the discipline that I went through, and maybe even with you, did the discipline that you had to go through with your, your father or your mother, did it not help prepare you for life? Did it not stop you from going down the wrong path and maybe headed down the right path? And, and maybe it was that you needed to be disciplined more than once, more than twice, maybe several times. But finally, like me, in my hard head, it sunk in. reason he gave me this word and, and I respect him and because I respect him and his word I'm going to want to obey that word to know what to do and what not to do is probably one of the hardest things for us to understand when we're talking about discipline sometimes our wants outweigh our needs. Sometimes our wants will cause us to convince ourselves that what we're going to do is really not all that bad. I wonder if that thought ever entered Eve's mind. All I did was bite a piece of fruit, eat a fruit, piece of fruit. What's so wrong with that? You disobeyed me, Eve. I'm very disappointed in that. And because of that, I'm going to cast you and Adam out of this garden for the rest, for all your life. And death is going to start because of this. Hopefully, we will learn through discipline that as a, as a Christian, I will learn to respect or fear God and the discipline that He can give on to me today. So that I won't see the discipline on the day of judgment. Look at verses 7 through 9 of Hebrews 12. If you endure the chastening of God, if you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there that a father does not chasten? But if you are, but if you are without chastening, of which have all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us and we paid them respect. 
Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father, the spirits, and live? That's a very interesting question. Is there anyone in here that didn't get angry at their parents or their father when he disciplined them? <laughs> I know I did. But soon that anger turned to remorse. And I would go to my father and I'd say, Dad, I'm sorry. Mom, I'm sorry. And I did that because I respected them. The third thing I want to talk about with discipline is the pain of discipline. The pain. You know, the saying is true. This is going to hurt me more than it's going to hurt you when you're talking to a child. Because when I had to discipline my daughter, and she would look at me with those sad puppy dog eyes, I was like, oh, how can I discipline this child? She knew how to get to me. And it hurt me. I did it, and I may have to go outside to the garage or to the the shed or even to my own room just to get away from her after I punished her. Because it did hurt me. But yet I knew that I needed to do that. And you know, I wonder if God cries out of pain because we fail Him. Look at verse 11 of Hebrews 12. Now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Discipline has a purpose. Children will never think that discipline is short in nature. To hear them talk about discipline, it's just short of death. You killed me. You're just destroying me. I can't believe you're doing this to me. I'm grounded for how many weeks? I'm going to die. <laughs> Get into your room, right? Oh, I see maybe that been been used here a couple of times. Okay. Oh, it's just going to kill me, Mom. I've got a date. Or uh, I need the car to go out and do this. You're killing me, Mom. I'm not going to be popular with my friends if you tell me I can't go out. Friends, do you realize in the Old Testament that an unruly child could be put to death? You know, discipline was used back then to keep children in line. And it's used today to keep people in line, to keep children in line. And it's painful. It hurts them as much as it hurts us. And I do believe without a doubt that on the day of judgment it's going to hurt God as much as it's going to hurt the person to hear. Depart from me. You curse me. Why is discipline needed? Why is it that we discipline our children? Why is it that we self-discipline ourselves because it's warranted. We fail at the warnings or my children fail at the warnings. Look at verse 18 beginning uh, of chapter 12. For you have not come to the mountain that you may be touched and that burned with fire and the blackness and the darkness and the tempest, the sound of, the, of a trumpet and the voice of the word, so that those who heard it begged that the word should not be spoken to them anymore, for they could not endure what was commanded. And if so much as a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned or shot with an arrow. And so terrifying, Moses said, I am exceedingly afraid and trembling. 
But you have come to the Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, and the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn, who are registered in heaven, to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the just men, made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. The writer here in this uh, little bit of text here is reminding you and I, the readers, of what happened back in Exodus. When Moses was told on a so-and-so day, I want you to have the children, when you hear the, the trump and you see the clouds come around the mountain, I want you to have, have the children of Israel come to the foot of the mountain and don't Tell them, do not touch the mountain because if they do, they will die. And the children of Israel were scared when they heard the, heard the rumblings and the roaring and the voice of God. But they all adhered to the warning, don't touch the mountain. And even your animals, your beasts, don't let them touch because if they do, we're going to, it, it, it too will die. It's amazing to me that, at least as far as we know, no one touched the mountain that day. No one lost their life that day because they heard the warning and they adhered to it. And this is found in Exodus chapter 19, beginning in verse 7. So how do we respond when we are disciplined? How did you respond when you were disciplined as a child? <laughs> did you go in your room, shut the door, slam it, pout? I see some heads doing this. I see somebody doing this. Yeah, we probably did. I'm sorry. I, I even tried to run away. Yeah. I got I got a spanking. My sister is my sister's fault. I got a spanking for something, and she even helped me pack my bags. So what did you do? How did you respond? And let me ask you this. When you read the scripture and it tells you to do certain things and you're not doing it, how do you respond to God when He tells you to do something? The instructive discipline. Well, in Hebrews chapter 12, beginning in verse 12, going through verse 17, where the Hebrew writer there tells us to stand up, to continue onward and upward, keep going on a straight path. Don't pout about it. Straighten up and act right. And my dad would say something like, uh, straighten up and fly right. Look at verse 12. Let's read that. Therefore strengthen the hands which hang down in the feeble knees and make straight your paths, or make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be desolate or dislocated, but rather be healed. Pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled, lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau, who for one morsel of food sowed his birthright. For you know that afterward, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place of repentance, though he sought it diligently with tears. You know, I, on the day of judgment, when man stands before God, they may be pleading with God, God, I'm sorry, I, I, I apologize, I'm, I, I should have done better, but I didn't, and I, and I, and I ask your forgiveness. And they may be having tears stream down their face like what we're told about here in verse 17. But you know, it's going to be too late. It'll be too late then. Go, on, go down and look at verse 25 beginning. See that you do not refuse Him, and that's speaking about Jesus, who speaks. For if they do not escape who refused Him, who spoke on earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from Him who speaks from heaven. Whose voice then shook the earth? But now he has promised, saying, Yet once more I will not shake only the earth, but heaven. 
Friends, I believe that this is in reference to the day that God returns. The trumpet of the Lord is going to sound. All the dead in Christ will rise first. And then we who are alive will meet Him in the air. And then so shall I ever be with our Lord. Friends, it's very easy to get angry when we're being disciplined. And I, I, I got angry at my parents. But the reason they disciplined me, disciplined me was to correct a problem in me. I might not have understood it right then, but I promise you, my dad used this saying on me, and yours probably did on you. One day you'll understand when you have kids. And I did. And yet it was still the hardest thing I ever had to do was discipline my children. We did not have bad children, Nancy and I. We, we had really good children. But there were still times that we had to discipline them. And not every time that we had to do this was a corporal punishment. Because we tried to make sure that the punishment fit the crime. But the punishment of hell will fit the crime because man is refusing to accept God's way. Man is ignorant, maybe, to God's way. Whatever it is, it doesn't matter. If they are not obedient to what God says, they're going to receive punishment that fits the crime. God's Word disciplines us. And it disciplines us now so that we won't regret it later when Judgment Day comes. It may be that there's someone here tonight that needs to repent of sin. It may be there's someone here tonight that wants to put Christ on in baptism and have those sins washed away. I, you know, I, I don't know. Maybe there's someone here that uh, just needs the prayers of the church like Margaret asked for this morning. Whatever it is, make it right. But make sure that if you're <laughs> going to face the discipline of God in a negative way, that you do what is necessary tonight so that you don't face God in judgment and receive the wording Depart from me. So if you need to respond to the Lord's invitation, do it now as together we stand.